I want us to begin this time of worship in the word by praying together. Would you, would you pray with me? Father, this morning we, we have declared your praises, the praises of your son. We have invited your Holy Spirit to work in this room. And so we continue that prayer this morning. That as we open up your word, that you would use the spirit of God to take the word of God and make us more like the son of God. That in these moments, as, as we begin to unpack your truths, that we would see where you are leading us as a church family. The call that you have on each of us individually, the design that you have on us collectively, the purpose that you have for us in this community. Father, this morning, you, you would begin something fresh in each person in the room. This morning, as you're gathered here in worship, would you pray for yourself? Would you thank God for the opportunity to, to be seated in a room like this, surrounded by people who, who are praising his name, and, and ask God to move in your heart this morning in a fresh way? And pray for those who are seated near you, especially if you know them by name. Pray Pray that God would, would move in their lives as well. And would you pray for all of us, yourself and all those in this room, pray for those who are in the, the first service, that as we leave this place today, that, that we recognize that there is a world around us that's in need of hope. And that God would begin giving us his eyes for those who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Pray that God would change us for the glory of Jesus. Father, that is our prayer this morning, that as we are in this room, that we are not here simply checking off something on our list then we're not here simply going through the motions. But this morning, as we have sung and now as we worship in your word, that you truly would grip us and change us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, I want you to open up to Numbers, the Old Testament book of Numbers. If you do not have a Bible, but you've got a device, I encourage you to join us in Numbers. We believe the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us more like the Son of God. And so I want you to see that these are God's words and, and not mine, and that you would re recognize that being in the Word each and every day truly transforms our lives as we invite the Spirit to work in us and make us more like Jesus. We'll be in Numbers today. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the fourth book in that Old Testament. It may be a book you've never read before. Some of you this week have begun reading through Numbers, and you're asking yourself, what in the world is he doing? Well, I, I hope that over the next 12 weeks together, you'll recognize God's voice speaking to you from these texts. It, it's, a, it's a question I, I myself asked several months ago when I preached these passages in Winsboro, Texas. And I would ask that you continue praying for First Baptist Church Winsboro. Today, they begin the process that you all began more than a year ago of preparing to call a new pastor. And in, in those final months that I was there, the Lord took us to Numbers. And, and it was a, a fascinating journey. And, and my prayer is that it will be equally fascinating and gripping and life-changing for all of us as we make our way into numbers. I've entitled the, the series of messages, Analytics Beyond the Numbers. There's more to this book than simply a list of names and a collection of numbers. Back in 1971, there was a group that was formed called the Society for American Baseball Research often called SABR, S-A-B-R, the Society for American Baseball Research. I love playing baseball. I love watching baseball. I'm not very good at coaching baseball, but I give it a try from time to time. But I never have thought I want to sit down and study baseball so closely that I can know all the numbers frontward and backward. But this group in 1971 was filled with such geeks. They decided we want to study baseball. And what began to happen from these sabernomics that were coming from this group is that they realized there were more than just stolen bases and more than batting average. They, they looked at beyond just the numbers at what it meant about maybe some of those players that might be overlooked, but truly were really important members of a team. In fact, there was a, a book and a, a, 
a movie about Billy Bean, who was the general manager for the Oakland Athletics, a small market team there in Oakland, but because he looked beyond the simple numbers, he was able to turn Oakland into a juggernaut to be able to compete against large market teams like the New York Yankees. And so what I want us to do is, is look beyond simply just numbers in this book or just words on a page, but over the next 12 weeks to see, God, what is it that you have for us in this book? I've entitled today's message, Great Expectations, because what I want you to see is, is what God was telling his people then, and if his expectations were those expectations then, then they're even greater expectations now. If you're not familiar with the scripture, let me set the stage. In Genesis, you get the beginnings. You find how God spoke everything into being, and then eventually in Genesis chapter 12, where he called one man to be his follower, Abraham. And over time, he, he made a promise to Abram and changed his name to Abraham. And he told him he'd be the father of a nation, a great nation, more, than, more people than could be counted. And over time, that came true. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And those sons had many sons and daughters. And over time, that group had made their way down into Egypt. And they found themselves for 400 years in slavery. And in that time of slavery, they called out to this God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. For 400 years, they prayed. And finally, God set them free. And so you get that story in Exodus, how God brought Moses back to those people in Egypt and how Moses in his ministry was able to lead the people out. If you're not familiar with the story, I encourage you to read in Exodus and you'll see that God brought 10 plagues on Egypt, plagues that, that attacked the gods of their land, plagues that made the, the Pharaoh realize he was not who he thought he was, that God was the only true God and he was supreme. And the very last plague that came on the land was the plague of death. God had told his people, the Israelites, those descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that if they wanted to avoid that final plague, they needed to slay an innocent lamb to take its blood and put its blood on the doorpost of their home. And that night, as the angel of death passed over Egypt, his promise to them was, you'll survive. No one in your home will die because you've trusted in the blood of the lamb. And that night, that very thing happened. The angel of death passed over, and those families who hid in their homes and had no idea what God was doing discovered that because they had trusted in the blood of the lamb, they survived. Their firstborn was still alive, and that next morning... Pharaoh awoke to find that his firstborn had died because, of course, he was not going to trust in this God he didn't believe in. And Pharaoh let the people go, and Moses began to lead the people out. And so they had found redemption through the blood of the Lamb. They had been brought out of slavery, and then they found themselves at the waters of the Red Sea, hemmed in, by, in front by the water and the approaching Pharaoh army from behind. And as Moses prayed and the people called out, God opened up the waters. And so they passed through the waters of the Red Sea. And then those waters collapsed on the approaching army. And so there they were then in the desert, having been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, having passed through the waters of the Red Sea. Now they were a people, but they had never been God's people. They had always been the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and yet now they were the ones called out by Yahweh, the great I Am. And so there they were in the desert for a year. Because God wanted them to know what it meant not only to be free, but to be holy. And so you get Genesis, which is the beginning, and then Exodus, which tells of their release. But then you get Leviticus, everybody's favorite Old Testament book, right? Some of you have started that read the Bible through process at the beginning of this year. And in a few weeks, you're going to get to Leviticus and you're going to wonder, am I really going to survive this book? It, it's a hard book to go through because it's this picture of holiness and what it requires to be holy. And it requires lots of blood. It requires lots of discipline. It, it requires actually the grace of God poured out on his people. And so for a year, they sat there in the desert learning how to be holy. And then here we pick up with them in numbers because now that they've been redeemed, they've passed through the waters, they've been given instruction on holiness. Now they can begin their journey. And so if you look on, on your sermon handout, the first point that I want you to see is there in chapter one. And the truth that God shows us in this first chapter is God expects individuals to serve in his kingdom. God expects individuals to serve in his kingdom. Look in Numbers chapter one. We'll read those first three verses. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the wilderness of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after Israel's departure from the land of Egypt. Take a census 
of the entire Israelite community by their clans and their father's families, counting the names of every male one by one. You and Aaron are to register those who are 20 years old or more by their military divisions, everyone who can serve in Israel's army. As God spoke to his people, as they had been freed, as they had passed through the waters, as they had learned about holiness, now as they're going to be this entire nation following the Lord, moving with the Lord for the glory of the Lord, he wanted them to know that everyone had to serve. There were, as I mentioned, 12 tribes, 12 of these sons of Israel who over the, those 400 years in Egypt had, had prospered. And yet they all still trace their roots back to one of those 12 sons. They were the 12 tribes. But Joseph, because of his position before the Lord, his, the, the reason that, that he was able to help the people survive, Joseph gave a, a tribe to both of his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So there were 13 altogether. And these tribes were ready to, to move forward, but God had specific instruction for 12 of those tribes. And he tells them, name them one by one, mark them out, get them ready for military work. God ex expected those individuals to serve. It didn't matter what tribe you were in. If you were 20 years or older, God's expectation was that you would serve. And here's what's interesting. How are they going to serve? Those 12 tribes, the men in those tribes, 20 years or older, they were to be the military force for this nation. They'd never been a military force. They'd been slaves for 400 years. There was no one who could show them what it was like to be a military force. No one who could show them what it was like to protect this community. No one who could show them what it was like to wander through the desert toward this promised land. And yet God was calling them to something they had never done. Why would God do that? He calls you to do things you've never done through his power so that he receives the glory when it happens. And so in this process, he's, he's saying that every individual, he says, name them one by one, mark them out, put them in the census. This is why the book is called Numbers. Over and over, there, there are these names and there are these numbers because there is this expectation that they will serve, even though they've never done it before. So what does that mean for us today? Well, I find it interesting. If, if you look back in verse one, it says the first day of the second month of the second year. They'd spent an entire year in the desert. This week as I was studying, I began to think back, and it's been just a little over a year ago, maybe 15 months ago, that Brother Steve stood in this pulpit, and Brother Steve told you that the time was coming for his retirement. And so for a year, you all have been praying. For a year, you all have been wondering, God, who are you bringing here? For a year, you've been wondering, where are we going and what are we going to do? And now God begins to unveil it. Am I Moses? No. No. But I am the shepherd that God has called to this congregation, that you ha have opened the door to us. And so together, we'll begin this process. And so for a year, you've been wondering, where are we going to go? And for a year, you have been praying. For a year, God has been preparing every single person in the life of this church for this moment. And so what it means is that over the next few months, as we walk through numbers, God may be calling you to something you've never done before. But he's doing it precisely so you can be obedient and he can be glorified. God is calling you to something. He expects every member to serve. In Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, Paul likens the church to a body. Paul says that, that every member of the church functions in the body. And so what that means is that you have some type of function in this church. On Sunday mornings, you see it in a variety of places. You have some who are up here leading in worship and song. You have those who are at the doors who are ushering, those that are at the outside doors greeting. You have some teachers. You have some workers in TK's place and in the preschool taking care of our children. There are lots of places to serve on Sundays, but that's not the only spot. There are other ways to be on mission in the city and around the world. There are committees and teams that do the work in the church. There's a prayer ministry that undergirds everything the church does. But what it means is that in this room, there is no seat that is occupied by someone inconsequential. That means that every person in this room has a calling from God to serve in his kingdom. And today, God is awakening you to the fact that you have a role to play. And it may be something brand new. But what it means is there will be no idle members. If you ever wake up in the middle of the night, you realize you've been lying on your arm in your sleep. Isn't that the worst feeling? 
You try to move it, it doesn't move just right, and then it begins to tingle. It's because it's a body part that isn't functioning well. We don't want a, a church full of people who are not functioning. We want to be like this group who stands before the Lord and says, I want to serve in your kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, as Paul is talking to the church as being a body, he also said God has given gifts. And so if you as a believer have come out of the slavery of bondage and into new life in Christ. You've gone through the waters of baptism as we saw those four brothers and sisters this morning. You, you are then at this point of saying, now I understand what it takes to come to life. And it's not me, it's the work of Jesus. But now I understand that he's called me to this new life of holiness. And so I want to walk in that holiness. Today, God is calling you to service in the kingdom. Over these next 12 weeks, we'll begin to explore what that looks like. On Wednesday nights at midweek, as we gather in here, I'll expand a little more of the vision that God has given me to share with you about how we can reach the lake area with the hope of Jesus because they are desperately in need of hope. And it won't happen because I'm doing it. It will happen because we are all functioning in our role in the kingdom. God's expectation is that every person will serve. So teenagers, that means that you can serve as well. Children, that means that you have a role. If you are in Christ, if you've come from death to life and the Holy Spirit has filled you, then that means that you have a role to play. You can pray for those who are lost. You can serve the people of the church. You can bring glory to Jesus through your service. But God's expectation then is his expectation now that his people serve. Amen. Second thing is in chapter two, and it is this truth. God expects to be the priority in our daily lives. God doesn't want us only serving him. God wants us to serve because he is the priority. There are some who serve because they want to become the priority. They, they want to be on the stage so that people see them, or they want to be at the door so that, that people notice them. God is not calling you to, to some prominence. God is calling you to service because he is the priority. He is the king. He is the one that all the world needs to see. Jesus is the king that the world needs to know. The spirit is the teacher and the counselor. That is the only way that, that we will know his truth and walk in his truth. God has to be the priority, not your service, not, not your own plans, but God and God alone. And if you look in chapter two, it talks about how they organized the camps. That God spoke to Moses, Moses talked with Aaron, Aaron talked with the people. And you'll see that they began to assemble themselves in order. That there were three of these tribes who were to the north and three that were to the east and three that were to the south and three that were to the west. But what was in the middle? It was that final tribe I mentioned, the tribe of Levi, that they were there around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the tent where God's presence dwelled. And, and every morning as they would wake up and they would step out of their tent, they would stretch and prepare for the day. They would remember God, his presence is literally in the middle of our camp. That, that every day they would look because God had told them that he would be visible, that, that he, in, in the daytime it would be this pillar of cloud and at night it would be this pillar of fire that they would see his presence. And so there was this continual reminder that God was the priority. God was central in everything that they did. Look in verse 17 of chapter 2. Numbers chapter 2 verse 17. It says, the tent of meeting is to move out with the Levites camp, which is in the middle of the camps. They are to move out just as they camp, each in his place with their banners. And so as you read through that chapter, you see all 12 of those tribes and the Levites around the, the tabernacle. There were days that, that they would remain still, that they would camp and remain camp because God wasn't moving. But there were other days that God would make visible, make evident that it was time for them to move. And so there would be six tribes who would precede the tabernacle. It would be in the middle, six tribes who would be behind it. And as they moved, they were following the lead of Yahweh himself. God was in the, the priority of their lives, whether they were still or whether they were moving. In the morning and at night, God was central, the priority. And so today, that, that means that his expectation remains the same. That for them, the tabernacle was in the middle. For us, it means that every morning, it is this opportunity to wake up and say, Jesus, today, you are king. I'm the servant. That today, I, I want you to be the priority in my life. So teenagers, it means that, that you look at life through the lenses of Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I want to treat my parents. I want to treat my friends. I want to treat my teachers the way you would treat them. I want to see them the way you see them. The parents, it means that, that you look at your children through the lens of Jesus. And rather than raising them to become certain things that society expects, 
You say, Jesus, you're the priority. I want my children to become the people you've made them to be. The families, it means that you look at your priorities and and the way you spend your time and your money and, and all that you do begins to be looked at through the lenses of Jesus because he is the central priority of life. So that no matter your age, if you've come out of the bondage of slavery and into life in Christ, you've passed through those waters. It is this declaration that I am dead, but Christ has brought me to life. I'm going to live in this new way. That it means that that you organize your entire life around Jesus. Because his expectation is that we serve him. But what good is it in serving him if he's not the priority? And so we see in chapter one, the expectation is service. And in chapter two, the expectation is the priority. But if you go to chapter three, you see in chapter three that God expects humility from those who serve him. God expects humility from those who serve him. As I mentioned, you you can serve and serve with wrong motives. It can be that you're wanting to get your way or, or you wish you had someone else's gift and you want to serve in that way. And yet the humility says, no, this is about who God is. This is the call he has on my life. He is the one who brought me from death to life. He is the one who erased my shame and gave me honor. He's the one who took away my weakness and gave me his strength. And so my my whole life is centered around him. And so I want to live up to his expectations. There's no way that I could ever look at this and say I've earned it. There's this humility. Look look how he describes it in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. These are the family records of Aaron and Moses at the time the Lord spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. These are the names of Aaron's son, Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of Aaron's sons, the anointed priests who were ordained to serve as priests. But Nadab and Abihu died in the Lord's presence when they presented unauthorized fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no sons. So Eliezer and Ithamar served as priests under the direction of Aaron, their father. Verse 5. The Lord spoke to Moses, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them to the priest Aaron to assist him. They are to perform duties for him and the entire community before the tent of meeting by attending to the service of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting and perform duties for the Israelites by attending to the service of the tabernacle. Assigned the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They have been assigned exclusively to him from the Israelites. You're to appoint Aaron and his sons to carry out their priestly responsibilities. But any unauthorized person who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. Verse 11, the Lord spoke to Moses. See, I've taken the Levites from the Israelites in place of every firstborn Israelite from the womb. The Levites belong to me. God was calling them to serve. God was calling them to make him the priority. God was calling them to humility because the Levites were going to serve in a different way from the remainder of the 12 tribes. Those 12 tribes had assigned those men to military duty. They they camped themselves around the tabernacle. They led and were behind the tabernacle. But the Levites, the Levites had a different role. God had set them aside to serve Aaron and his priestly group. He had had set all of them, Aaron and all of the Levites, aside to do what what no one else did. And there may have been times that some of those Levites would have said, I I really wish I could do something different than this. I I wish there were days that that I could strap on a sword and and, and I could go out and fight. There there are days that I, I wish I weren't stuck here at the tabernacle, folding these curtains or putting up these pillars. There may have been days that they didn't want to do what God had called them to do, and yet they had to serve in humility. It is because they had to realize we were in slavery and now he set us free. We were being attacked and he brought us through the waters. And so I'll do what he's assigned me to do because he's the king. I'm not. There had to be this humility that said, this is his plan. This is for his glory. And this is how he has equipped me. And so every one of us has to to serve in humility and say, I've got to discover what is my gift. When when God brought me to life in Christ, he gave me a gift to serve the church. And and I want to serve the church because he's the priority. This is his bride. I want him to receive the glory. And I've got to figure out what is that. And as I mentioned, it may be something you've never done before. And it may be something you would look at and go, God, I I just don't think I would be very good at that. God, that that won't get much attention. And God says, I've chosen you. 
I've called you and I've equipped you. Do this. And do this so that the church flourishes and Jesus is glorified. These men, these Levites, had to serve in a way that no one else served. They served the priests who were the connection between God and man. And they served so that God could be glorified. And no one else could be the Levites. There were probably other times that some of those other 12 tribes said, I wish I could get a little closer to God. I I wish that I could serve in such a way that I was there at the tabernacle. But look again in verse 10 of chapter 3. It says, you're to appoint Aaron and his sons to carry out these priestly responsibilities. But any unauthorized person who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. If you're taking notes, jot down to Leviticus chapter 10. In Leviticus chapter 10, remember I mentioned Genesis, the beginning, Exodus, leaving slavery. Leviticus, learning how to be holy. In Leviticus chapter 10, we read about Nadab and Abihu, those that were mentioned at the beginning here, chapter 3. Sons of Aaron, who decided God had given them certain rules about how to lead worship, they decided they'd worship the way they wanted. They brought what the Bible describes as unauthorized fire. They, They were coming to God on their own rules, by their own standards, and God killed them. Is that because God loves death? Absolutely not. But God is holy above all things. And he says, you walk by my standards and not your own. And so Nadab and Abihu had died in front of all of the assembly to be reminded, this is God's plan. This is God's kingdom. We walk in God's way. And so there is this reminder there in the desert as they're getting ready to move out that God calls for humility. You fill the role God has given you and you do so with joy. Because he is the priority and serving his kingdom, serving his people is our joy. You serve with humility. Look in verses 40 to 51 of chapter three. Verse 40, he says this, the Lord told Moses, register every firstborn male of the Israelites one month old or more and list their names. You're to take the Levites for me. I am the Lord in place of every firstborn among the Israelites, and the Levites' cattle in place of every firstborn among the Israelites' cattle. So Moses registered every firstborn among the Israelites as the Lord commanded him. The total number of the firstborn males was one month old or more, listed by name. It was 22,273. The Lord spoke to Moses again. Take the Levites in place of every firstborn among the Israelites, and the Levites' cattle in place of their cattle. The Levites belong to me. I am the Lord. As the redemption prize for the 273 firstborn Israelites who outnumber the Levites, collect five shekels for each person according to the standard sanctuary shekel, 20 geras to the shekel. Give the silver to Aaron and his sons as the redemption price for those who are in excess among the Israelites. Verse 49. So Moses collected the redemption among those in excess of the ones redeemed by the Levites. He collected the silver from the firstborn Israelites. 1,365 shekels measured by the standard sanctuary shekel. He gave the redemption silver to Aaron and his sons in obedience to the Lord, just as the Lord commanded Moses. As God called these Levites to serve the people, all of the nation realized they're doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. They are standing in our place before Yahweh. And, and as a result, they, they gave offerings. And so those 12 tribes were thankful for that 13th tribe. They they looked and in humility realized they're doing for us what we ought to have to do ourselves. And so there was this appreciation among the people for those who were serving the Lord in that special way. There was a humility that realized if not for them, we would have no connection to God. Today, it's somewhat different. There still remains within the church that this pastoral leadership team that God has brought to help lead you as a people. And, and there is a difference in our calling and your calling. And, and we do what God has called us to do, but you do what God has called you to do. I can't fill your role and you can't fill mine. And so there is this continual humility that God has called us and saved us. But there's also this humility with one another, recognizing we, we work best when we work for the Lord and fulfilling our particular roles. He calls us to serve the kingdom. He calls us to make him the priority. He calls us to walk in humility. But the fourth thing is is there in chapter four, that God expects discipline from his servants. 
God expects discipline from his servants. We've already seen how there has to be humility. And, and I see often that humility breeds discipline. When you're humble before the Lord, you don't want to waste what he has done. When you're humble before the Lord, you don't want to do anything that would dishonor him. And so you live in discipline. There, there were among the Levites, there were three different clans. The Kohathites, the Merorites, and the Girgashites. And they had different roles. One group would help assemble and take down all of the pillars, the hardware of the temple. Another group would take down all the curtains and, and the drapery that were inside and outside the, the tabernacle itself. But there was this third group, the Kohathites, and you see, you see them in chapter 4, verse 17. The Kohathites would go into the tabernacle and they would take out all those holy pieces of furniture. The Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God sat. The, the table where the, the, the bread of presence would be placed. The lampstand that they lit every morning. The, the, the altar where they burned incense. That The Kohathites would go and move those. But look what he says in, in chapter 4, verse 17. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Do not allow the Kohathite tribal clans to be wiped out from the Levites. Do this for them so that they may live and not die when they come near the most holy objects. Aaron and his sons are to go in and assign each man his task and transportation duty. The Kohathites are not to go in and look at the holy objects as they are covered or they will die. The Kohathites knew they had one role. It was to go in and to take those holy objects out. And then when the tabernacle was reassembled, to take those holy objects back in. But they were draped. They couldn't see them. And can you imagine going in and the temptation there might have been to peek under the curtain, to look at that golden altar of incense, to look at that lamp stand that they lit every morning, to look at the table where they placed the bread, or even more, to peek back and to look at the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence sat. But they knew that was not their role. That the priests could see those, but not the Levites. And so their job was to go in and simply do what God called them to do. So what does it mean for us? It means that, that we find where God has called us, and we serve in humility, and we do so in discipline every day, on good days and bad days, on days when we feel like it and days when we don't, that we serve the Lord with discipline. He has given us time. We want to use that time with discipline. He's given us certain talents and gifts. We want to use those talents and gifts to bring him glory. He's given us treasures, whether that's possessions or money. And we want to use those so that he is glorified. God expects that we would do so in discipline each and every day, knowing our role and fulfilling only that role, but fulfilling that role with gladness. The fifth point is sprinkled throughout the first four chapters. The fifth point is obedience is the key to a successful journey. If you got your Bible open still, go back to the end of chapter one. Obedience is the key to a successful journey. They've been freed. They've gone through the waters. They've learned about holiness. And now they're getting ready for this journey. And God has called them to service, to making him the priority, to humility, to discipline. Those are concepts. They must be acted on. So look at the end of chapter one, verse 54. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord God had commanded Moses. Look at the end of chapter two. Chapter two, verse 34. The Israelites did everything the Lord commanded Moses. Look at the end of, of chapter three. Go to verse 51. He gave the redemption silver to Aaron and his sons in obedience to the Lord, just as the Lord commanded Moses. And then look at verse 49 of chapter four. At the Lord's command, they were registered under the direction of Moses, each one according to his work and transportation duty, and his assignment was as the Lord commanded Moses. Over and over, the people obeyed, because this wasn't a suggestion. This was a command. God was the one who had liberated them. They had not broken themselves out of slavery. God was the one who had taken them through the waters. It wasn't because they were great military might. They wanted to serve him. They had spent a year waiting, and now he was saying, here's the call. The, the call to service, the call to priority, the call to humility and discipline. And so you have to do it. So today, God is calling each and every person in Trinity Baptist Church to walk in this new direction. God is calling each and every person in this room now to consider, am I ready? 
I want to close with two brief questions. The first is this. Is God the supreme king or is he simply a trusted advisor? There are times that you've got those good friends in your life or, or a counselor that you may go see and, and they'll give advice and, and you will weigh what has been given and you'll do what, what seems good and then ignore what doesn't seem so good. Are you doing that with God? Or are you simply spending time with him and, and seeking him so he can make your life comfortable? Or is today he calling you to, to saying, over everything in my life, God's going to reign supreme. That Jesus becomes the central focus of my life. That, that I'm putting aside all of those old ways and old ideas, and today he's calling me to this. Some of you today may have realized, I've never been freed from the slavery of sin. I can't walk in holiness until I've been broken out of unholiness. And so today, when you respond, you may come down to one of these encouragers. Brother Greg will be down here. And you might say, I need Jesus to bring me to life. I can't do all these things God has described until Jesus sets me free. Some of you today, when you saw all these brothers and sisters up here, you realize, I've never done that. And if I'm going to walk in holiness, I've got to obey. And Jesus' command is to be baptized. And so today, you may come and say, I need to be baptized. God's expectations are great, and I, I want to fulfill those expectations. If you're still dead in sin, he wants to bring you to life today. If you're disobedient, he's calling you today to repentance and obedience. He doesn't simply want to be a trusted advisor. He wants to be the king of your heart. And so the second question, and the one that sets the frame for this entire book, is of which generation do you want to be a part of?